took a constitutional amendment to extend the vote to women. It took a Supreme Court case to desegregate schools. And it took a woman testifying before Congress to shed light on sexual harassment. For all the leaps forward for women and girls, true justice is still a dream deferred. This is why the 2012 Impact Awards honor defenders of women's rights in the courtroom, Capitol, and beyond. This year's honorees are attorneys, activists, and philanthropists who are creating a healthier, safer, and fairer world for women and girls. Chicago Foundation for Women is proud to present 10 awards to remarkable women and men whose accomplishments and continued work help balance the scales of justice. Many of the clients with whom I work face multiple obstacles in terms of language, in terms of cultural norms, a lack of understanding of the system. They have so many barriers, but also so many assets. And I think that because of my own cultural complexity, I understand that they navigate multiple worlds. Gender dynamics are similar and different in each unique community. And I think that the ability to listen to the client, to what she desires and what she needs, even if that's not easily attainable in the legal system, I think gives a client a sense of respect and dignity that can often be lacking in the legal process. I think about mentors in the past. I think about women who've been trailblazers. I think about uh, women who have inspired me to want to do this work. There's that saying, you know, if you help a woman, then you're helping her community. We're working to change outdated systems. We're working to fix broken systems. And we're essentially trying to get laws and statutes and policies to meet the needs of actual people. You know, the work with death penalty that happened way before I got to the ACLU, the parental notice work that we've been doing, our sex ed work, it's an opportunity for the legislature to catch up with where people are and what they need. In order to be successful in government, we have to be able to determine how to take the goals and aspirations of others and channel them into a common goal and aspiration. And being able to get access to health care is as inextricably linked to justice as economic abilities. Um, and then I look at the court system and determine, as long as you are treated more harshly when you are poor um, than when you are not poor, and the reason that you're treated more harshly is because you can't post bond. And I know that that's the system that we've devised, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be the system that we all determine can't be changed. I'm really encouraged by the sympathy that I think our nation and the world has developed for people who are trafficked. Um, but in Chicago, there are between 16,000 and 25,000 girls and women every year who are involved in the sex trade. That is entirely driven by the demand that men with resources are making for access to girls and women. They know are only there because they don't have anything resembling meaningful choices. That's what really needs to be focused on. As an attorney, I'd like to believe that the law protects us, and I think to some extent it does. We have equal rights laws, we have gender violence laws, uh, we have reproductive choice laws, but they're tenuous, and we need to, as women, elect the right people to office that will enforce those rights and protect them for us. True justice isn't just for women and girls, it's for everyone. It's for women, for girls, for men, for the racial minorities, and it means equal opportunities for everyone and the choice to decide what you want to do with your own life in terms of a career, in terms of family planning, be you a woman, a girl, being anybody. The attorneys help give these victims of domestic violence a voice to, to stop that cycle. They found that a, a staggering percentage of uh, people that were coming, coming into the domestic violence division were, had no representation. And so the purpose of this program is to try to take some of the more complex uh, situations and um, ensure that, that those people have representation. The particular asylum case I worked on uh, had a couple of major hurdles. For one was that this woman, um, she was from the Democratic Republic of Congo. The majority of the things that had happened to her that were terrible happened to her outside the Congo. And for purposes of asylum law, the persecution you suffer has to be in your country of origin. And so our first major hurdle was basically showing that 
this entire trafficking experience and all the atrocities that happened to her were part of one continuous experience that started in the Congo. In our minds, um, although we were very concerned, losing wasn't an option. You know, this woman's life was in danger and we wanted to make sure that she wouldn't have to go back there. Well, I received a call from Simone Jackson, who was a former client of mine, informing me of the fact that she had been shackled uh, during childbirth at Stroger Hospital. And it, when she told me that, it just seemed morally wrong. I contacted Ken, and we decided to file a lawsuit for Simone and the other women that went through the same ordeal. About 16,000 women go into pretrial detention every year in Cook County Jail. Around 50 women a year give birth uh, while in custody of Cook County Jail. When you're having a baby, you can only know that easing the pain will be able to, when you're able to move side to side or turn around in a bed. And by me being restrained from that, it was even painful. And the, the memories of it is, it's horrible. I mean, it's not a time that I can talk about having my second son that it doesn't bring sadness to me. Uh, one of the horrible stories is this woman was in labor and the guard was watching the NBA playoffs in the room. People should have been prosecuted for what was going on, but, but they haven't been and won't be. Two years after Roe v. Wade, Illinois passed omnibus anti-abortion laws. In 1979, we decided to establish a separate project, uh, establish some separate funding, and uh, unfortunately, the issues that Lori and Colleen have been discussing are very much the same ones you, we were hearing about then. Just to paraphrase the Supreme Court, the decision about whether and when to become a parent is among the most fundamental decisions and the most fundamental of rights that our Constitution protects. We were just so fundamentally offended last legislative session when the sponsors of the anti-abortion bills were permitted to assign their bills to the House Agriculture Committee. And within our office, we, as we got more and more worked up about it, we came up with this, you know, women are not livestock. And it really resonated. I mean, it was cute and it was funny and it was creative, but it was at, at some point it just really got you at your core because here we had the Illinois General Assembly um, purporting to protect women's health by treating women as though they were no better than, than farm animals. As the co-founder of Amigas Latinas, I was always, you know, wanting to meet Latina, lesbian, bi, trans, queer women. So when I met Christina, I quickly recognized the possibilities of her not only being part of, of the organization, but being a leader in the organization. I met uh, Christina actually when we were looking for new board members. And I remember reading her files, reading her application, and being really impressed that someone so young had already accomplished so much. I think for me to justice would be that Christina would be here getting this award. But I think what Christina would say was get over the sappiness. Christina made sure that her voice and her testimony and just her physical being, her presence at meetings, kind of brought to light the fact that you can't silence and you can't diminish the issues that impact queer women, queer women of color, women in general, um, and with, obviously with Amigas Latinas, the lives of queer Latina women.